ever since I was little, I have felt people around me. And it was more so of a feeling my whole life. It was kind of like I didn't know why I was feeling things. I just knew that I was. And I remember just feeling like I was constantly being watched. And as a child, it's a little bit intimidating and a little bit nerve wracking to feel like, okay, I'm being watched. Who's watching me? Why am I being watched? And I just remember like having so much anxiety as a little child. (laughs) I would get major headaches. I had probably four to five headaches a week that were like really severe headaches. And I was nervous. I was anxious. You know, there was so many things going on inside of me that I didn't necessarily know how to comprehend or how to move through it. And that was up until about like probably eighth grade that it was pretty severe in that space. You know, my parents, I'm so grateful for my parents because they, you know, they took me to the Western doctors. We did a lot of MRIs, CAT scans. We did so many different things to figure out why I had these severe headaches. You know, I went to a chiropractor. I went to a ther- like a physical therapist. I did all the things that I could. And at one point my mom was like, you know what? We just need to take it more of a different approach. And so I started going to get acupuncture when I was in seventh grade. <laughs> and then, you know, even in elementary school, when I would get these headaches, I would go to the nurse's office and they knew me by name. They're like, hi, Jenny. And they would give me some medicine. Let me lay down, put a washcloth on my head probably three times a week at school. And finally, my mom's like, okay, we got to try something else. So I started listening to a color meditation when I was little. So I would put this blind, like this wet washcloth on my head instead of taking Tylenol. Cause of course you don't take Tylenol that often throughout the week, especially as a young child. And every time I would just sit there, I would listen to the meditation with the little tape player (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and the headphones yep. and just lay there and listen to it. And I would fall asleep for a little bit and I'd wake up and then it was gone. And so that was like kind of my first mm. interaction really with meditation. It was all about colors, about the cocoon, about butterfly, kind of letting color lead where maybe your body had holes or energetically you were drained, kind of help clear that out. And I'm so grateful that my parents stood by me in that space and helped me kind of navigate through that. Mm -hmm. And then leading into junior high and high school, I started having kind of like, I guess you could say paranormal activity. I don't really like to call it that, but um, I would be maybe getting ready in the morning and all of a sudden the door would swing wide open and I could feel someone physically like if you were to close your eyes and have someone walk into the room, you could feel their energy walk in, even if your eyes were closed, it was happening to me and my eyes were open and there was nobody there. And so it was a little bit intimidating as you could imagine. I'm like, okay, that's different. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. And then all my friends, even when I was little, like in junior high and in elementary school, we'd be hanging out or playing and I'd be like, oh, we can't go over there. There's an old lady there, or there's a kid in a tree here. There's someone here. There's this and this. And I was just always talking about things and they just thought it was kind of a normal, I don't know, like a normal part of who I was. And even one of my childhood best friends, um, we hadn't been in communication for a while. And then she reached out and was like, Hey, I would love a session. And so she came over and we were just talking and she was laughing. She's like, now that I think about it, you were always talking about this stuff, even at like the age of six, I would always talk about different things like that. And so it was kind of fun Mm -hmm. to come full circle with her. She was like, this is totally what you've been doing your whole life and not even knowing it. And so I feel like at in, I think about eighth grade, I believe it was my grandfather passed away. And I remember being so drawn to what he was experiencing on the other side. And it was almost like I knew exactly what he was going through and what he was feeling and what he was saying without even fully understanding or knowing why I felt that. And it kind of terrified me because I was like, why do I feel so drawn to this? I don't want to cross over. I'm not ready to go, but I'm so drawn to what's going on. And at that point, my dad had been talking about this book called Return from Tomorrow, which is um, a 
a man who was in the service and he passed away and he had his experience, like an out of body and near death experience. And then he came back and I just sat there like so mesmerized in at such a young age. And I just started reading books about, you know, near death experiences, what people experienced. And it just kind of has been part of my experience this whole time. When I was in high school, um, I had a really good friend whose mom passed away and for whatever reason, I felt like I could just feel her around me a lot and I could feel, you know, maybe what she wanted to relate to me or different things like that. And this is part of the journey of stepping into spiritual gifts as well, Mm -hmm. is it's kind of like when you're getting started into this space, you don't necessarily know how to navigate through it and you don't know the best way to share these things and to move these things and to talk about these things as well. And so that was like a whole nother learning curve all in of itself. But, you know, I felt like she came to me in dreams or I'd be like reading my scriptures and I'd feel her like right by me. And so it kind of opened up the way to be a little more open to just knowing that people were there on the other side and kind of just trusting in that process. And it actually wasn't until after high school, I had a couple experiences with her and maybe some other ancestors um, that I knew that was going on, but I wasn't as, it kind of freaked me out a little like, well, I can't do that. And of course I grew up in, in like the LDS faith, which is very much so um, it's not as talked about. And in fact, not a lot of people are open to it which I understand completely in all aspects. I've looked at it from all different angles. And so it kind of was something that I didn't give myself permission to fully experience only because I was worried that I was going against God's will or I was going against, I don't know, what I had always been taught. And it was very painful. It was a very heavy experience to be navigating through that where it was like, this is just naturally part of who I am, but it goes against everything that I thought it went against everything that I had experienced growing up. And it's so interesting because I ended up actually going to, um, to China to teach English after high school for four and a half months. And during that time, I had a lot of worries, doubts, fears, a lot of confusion step in. And I have an older brother who has very similar gifts Um, but he called me when I got home and he was like, Hey, I have a message for you. I'm like, what the heck is he talking about? So I go over and I'm sitting on his couch and he's like, grandma case has a message for you. It's like, okay, I should already know about all this because you know, I've experienced it already. And so I just sat there and I hadn't talked to him. I, in fact, I was all the way across in China and didn't speak to him that often And in this message that he read me, it was every single thing I've been worrying about, doubting, fearing, all of it was addressed in that one letter. And it was at that moment that I came to this space of, wow, this can be such a powerful gift if it's used in the correct ways. And he gave me that space and showed me that this has been a gift that's run down our family line for generations and generations. Mm -hmm. And I feel like when it comes to spiritual gifts in general, all of us have the ability, all of us are connected. All of us have that space to receive guidance, to receive inspiration. But it's once Mm -hmm. we give ourselves permission to trust that we can do that is when our gifts really start to open. And at that moment I said, okay, I'm going to trust this. I'm just going to jump in and see what happens and how it comes and how it goes. And, and that was kind of the launching pad was that message that my brother gave me and really giving me permission to kind of step into that. That that just had, yeah, so much courage. My goodness. Like I, I think about when, when I am connecting with spirit and then right before you share that message, Uh, especially in the beginning when you're trying to gain confidence and courage to share these messages, it is like jumping off a high dive into the clouds. Like you just really don't, it is super scary. 
um, because you're not going to get validation. You just have to trust. I mean, you might get validation from them, but I'm not, I'm saying you'll get validation before you deliver the message. It's not like before you say, yeah, for sure, this is correct. So before I deliver the message, yeah, yeah, you're just you trusting. really put yourself, yeah, you put really put yourself out there, you know, and, and also the, the fears that come up, it's like, what if I'm wrong? What if, you know, what if I'm not, what if this doesn't resonate with this person? What if they say they don't understand what I'm saying, or they're not sure who I'm talking about, or, and you learn over time that you are a messenger. Yes. And that you are just supposed to trust the message and however it comes out, it'll come out. And then maybe tomorrow, the next day after that, they'll find out they really did have Uncle George or they had this who came through or, yes. or all of a sudden this message will make sense to them. And then it will unfold in the way that it's supposed to, because it's the messages that come through a spirit are needed. Absolutely. They really are exactly what you need to hear at this time in order to move forward it, it, that validation for me as a healer has come through again and again. And, and I love the way that you mentioned that earlier, that even when you got the message from your brother, you weren't expecting it, yeah. but it was everything. It addressed every fear and question that you had. And that makes you realize that this work is super sacred Very that you're sacred. doing. Yeah. yeah. And, and it can be taken if it's not in the right context, it can be taken um, not as healing as you think it could be as well as like, you know, that was one of the processes is learning how to trust what was coming forward and how things happened and how our ancestors and how the gifts of the spirit really worked for me. But it was also I learned that you cannot deliver a message unless somebody is open to it. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I feel like that's part of being a light worker is receiving the permission to deliver the message. Mm 